morning guys. Today we're headed out for a short mushroom foray. Let's go see what we can find. Well, it was a beautiful October day. We're out here at the property at the cabin and I'm hankering for some more wild mushrooms. So I just wanted to see what we could find. So we're going to head out in the woods, um, a few locations, see what we can find. October is the one of the best times of year actually to go mushroom foraging. So some of you who may not be able to go on a foray this year, well, I'll take you on one today. When we're foraging, we've got to look really carefully in all the nooks and crannies, and you can see this beautiful cyan or green-colored mushroom. This mushroom is the green stain mushroom. Some of you guys might be looking for turkey tail mushroom when you come across something like this. And this is not turkey tail, but let's see what it is. We'll just turn this around. Look at that. That is violet-toothed polypore. So again, for the turkey tail, we're going to be looking for something that looks like a turkey tail with lots of bands of color and um, white pores underneath. Here, we've got a white shell fungus with purple, like hair, underneath it. So this is called the violet tooth polypore. And just literally on the log behind where we found that polypore, here is a jelly fungus. It's called witch's butter. And it's a jelly fungus because when you squish it, it's very jelly-like. So there's lots of variety in terms of um, you know what mushrooms look like and feel like. Witch's butter is an edible mushroom, but must be boiled or steamed to enjoy it. Don't forget to look down the trunks of trees. Here we have a maize polypore. So when you look underneath it, you can appreciate a maize underneath the um, underneath the bracket of fungus. Here it looks like it's actually sitting on a birch tree. So it's really important too to identify the different trees in your area. When you get into mushroom foraging, you'll learn a lot about the local environment. Always survey where you are. Uh, here we are in a coniferous forest with a few uh, aspen, some birch, hemlock. Make sure to take a look around you. It'll really help you identify the mushrooms. The last fungus was a thin walled maize polypore. This one, however, is called the mossy maize polypore. You can see why it's got a greenish color to the top of the cap, a mossy texture. And underneath the cap, look at that, a little tiny maze-like pattern underneath. This time of year I find it kind of challenging to find mushrooms with all the leaves in the ground, but I see something yellow over here and I'm really excited, so I'm going to go check it out. Oh, just at my feet, look at this. Always look where you're walking. That's a really interesting mushroom. It is definitely not a chanterelle, it's not what I'm looking for right now but a beautiful mushroom. Really important to use your senses when mushroom foraging. So before I showed you the sense of touch with the, you know, the witch's butter there, that gelatinous type uh, fungus, I'm using my sense of smell on this one. This smells terrible. It smells like, it smells like fuel or something really, really bad. And it's a fresh mushroom. So, you know, I don't know what this one is, but I can bring it back and identify it uh, if I was interested in doing so. And sometimes your sense of smell is what helps you determine what mushroom this is. Let's take a look down here, guys. This is a chanterelle. How exciting. This is a choice edible mushroom, and you can tell it's a chanterelle by the false gills underneath. Take a look at the false gills underneath. They're thick. They branch and they wiggle all over the place. It has a faint smell of apricot as well. It's a very sweet smelling mushroom. It tastes really good. This one's a little bit worse for wear. It looks like the critters have had at it. It's a little bit late in the season for chanterelles here in October, but we've had a warm, rainy October, so I'm not surprised to see them in the woods. Here's another jelly mushroom. Let's take this one out here. This one's very rubbery in texture. This is the green-headed jelly club. Here's a wild edible mushroom called honey mushroom. And you can see this one is growing off a piece of wood, so that'll let us flip it around and take a look at it. So it's a brown mushroom. Its cap is a little bit scaly and dry. See, it's got a ring just near the top there, an annulus. And this uh, mushroom is really, really detrimental in the forest. It's one of the largest living organisms in the world. I think the mycelium can be many kilometers long for some of these guys. Um, but what it is, it's a parasitic fungus, and um, it also inhabits live wood as well as dead wood. And what it does is it goes through the wood, puts up these giant black runners, and just goes nuts. And it destroys the wood and breaks it down. So this is a uh, forester's nightmare to see um, the honey mushrooms in here. Um, they are an edible mushroom, but you have to be careful because other brown mushrooms that grow on wood, called the deadly gallerina, uh, are lethal, and so you never want to make a mistake with identifying a little brown mushroom, especially those growing on wood. Sometimes you can see these out in the open, but it means that there is wood buried below the surface. In this area as well, I was hiking through yesterday, and I found a ton of uh, chanterelles, which I had for uh, supper last night. 
So just goes to show you, um, keeping your eyes peeled this time of year, you may get a surprise. I was so thrilled to find chanterelles this late in the season. They're also in good condition. They weren't really chewed up by the bugs. Let's take a look down here. This is a cup fungus. I showed you this in the, the spring. It's called a pig's ear, and it's beautiful. Look at it. It's a beautiful cup fungus, brown in color. And it's uh, there's a lot of decayed wood in and around here and decaying wood. Just a haven for these kinds of fungus. This is another unique fungus. This one's called a coral fungus. There are many different species of them and different color variations and different sort of branchings uh, to the coral shape of them. Uh, some are edible, some are not edible. Here's another example of a coral fungus. This one, however, has a, a blackish color to it with buff colored tips. So fungus are so important in the forest. They break down the organic material on the ground, you know, like the leaves and things like that. Also, they can break down the wood in the trees. Some, like I said, are parasitic and they actually harm the tree. The honey mushrooms in our forest are actually doing a lot of damage to the cedar trees, which is kind of depressing. Um, but, you know, they have a role in the ecosystem and they're there for a reason. So, gotta love fungus. <laughs> they do lots for us. Um, you know, if we didn't have fungus and mushrooms like that, um, you know, I would be just up to my eyeballs or more in leaves and detritus. Um, fungus play a huge role in uh, helping out the forest and breaking things down over time. If you're interested in learning more about mushroom foraging itself, I did a, a podcast on my friend Bob's uh, channel, Gilgaloo Bird. So I'll put a link here um, so that you guys can go and watch it. I did it about a year ago or so. Um, it's filled with lots of information in regard to mushroom foraging. So um, go check it out. Check out the fall colors. I don't know if they've peaked near you. They're near peak here. Beautiful. I love the forest this time of year. There are no bugs. The colors are great. And of course, there's lots of mushrooms. Well, the beavers have moved back in. Take a look at that. They made several trails from our bay um, to go grab a bunch of birch. They've nipped off all the branches and they've kind of left the main tree down. They're definitely going to be changing the landscape around here. You can see there's another one down there. At least two that I've got on the trail cameras, so I'm sure they've had a little family and they'll be multiplying. Beavers are one of the biggest changers of our environment around here. And they, they really can adjust the ecosystem quite a bit. Oh yeah, what do we have over here? Right on. So tons more chanterelles. Woohoo guys, we lucked out. Well, some of them look a little bit old, so I don't know if I'll be eating them, but let's grab some of these. Again, we know it's a chanterelle from the thick ridges underneath and all the branching that's happening there. It's a few mutations that have occurred in this mushroom. On the surface of the mushroom, you'll notice that the cap, you know, flares open and you can see actually some of the underside of the cap on the top of the cap. And this is called a rose comb deformation. I know on my Facebook, you guys have learned about that. And that's just a mutation that's occurred in the mushroom um, during its development. This mushroom may look a little bit strange in how it developed, but it is still edible. It is a chanterelle. Since a lot of these are old, I'm just going to leave them to decay and release their spores into the environment. That way we'll get more chanterelles next year. I want to show you a picture of a false chanterelle that I found next to a true chanterelle. So you can see on the left, the false chanterelle is basically made up of gills that sort of branch in the shape of a, like a tuning fork. They make these multiple V's that go to the end of the, of the cap. It's a little bit darker in orange. It smells actually not so good compared to the sweet smelling uh, true chanterelle, which is on the right of your photo. The true chanterelle has false gills that are like ridges and they they branch and they wiggle underneath the uh, the cap and they they do divide but in a little bit different fashion than the false chanterelle i hope you can appreciate the difference here i know it can be very difficult and it wasn't really until i saw them in the field that i understood it myself so take a look at the images and maybe someday you'll come across a false chanterelle now the jury is out in terms of eating false chanterelles some people eat them obviously cooked however there is risks of hallucinations and um gastrointestinal upset so for that reason a lot of people say not to eat them well here's a site for sore eyes it's called pig's ear gomphus or the violet chanterelle it's a choice delicacy as you can see they're purple underneath and they've got that same kind of branching veininess that the chanterelle has and there's lots of it here let's harvest some just a beautiful mushroom it does have a bit of a pleasant smell not an overly mushroomy smell, and they're very meaty and crunchy, and that's why I love, when I cook mushrooms, I love mushrooms that uh, have a bit of texture to them, and they have good weight, almost like a lobster mushroom. So let's put a bunch of these in my pack. There's a ton of them down the pathway, so I'm going to collect more. 
um, and pan fry them up when I get home. Uh, I heard that pan frying them with ginger and thyme and of course a little bit of garlic um, is really good. So pumped. I'm in the cedar swamp now and I'm just looking beneath my feet and I found another really beautiful mushroom. This one's called angel wings. So it's got a very, very delicate um, shape to it. Very, very thin. You can see the gills underneath. It almost reminds you of an oyster mushroom. However, this is growing on wood that is a conifer. It's growing on old cedar. So it's called angel wings. This mushroom is reportedly edible. However, it's a big however, there was a history of poisoning in Japan several years ago. A large flush of angel wings came up. Many people ate it. It was fabulous. However, many weeks later, several people died, especially older people with kidney failure and swelling and inflammation of the brain. I think the uh, mushroom had uh, highly concentrated a type of toxin within it, and that's how they died. So again, this one's a huge caution. A lot of books will say it's not edible because of that specific problem that happened in Japan. I'm just going to enjoy it and leave it here in the woods. Here's a tasty little pan fryer. These are Lycoperidon perlatum, or the gem studded puffball. They can grow on leaf litter, and sometimes I've seen them growing on logs as well. They look like that when you take them out of the ground. And one important thing when you're harvesting these is to make sure they're not a false puffball or they're not actually the button form of a more toxic Amanita mushroom. So really important when you harvest these is to identify them properly and always cut each and every one in half to make sure that they're solid all the way through like a typical puffball. If you cut them in half and you can actually see gill structures and a stem and something that looks like a rudimentary cap, that is probably the button form of an Amanita mushroom which can be very toxic. Let's cut this in half and see what it looks like. There we go. So it is solid all the way through. Solid. Almost looks like a marshmallow, and that's kind of what you're looking for. These are nice little pan fryers if you cook them up really, really well. And with any wild mushroom that is determined to be edible, uh, be sure to cook them very thoroughly. There's very few wild mushrooms that you could eat raw. Here's an example of an older gem-studded puffball that has basically dried up, pops open, and produces these spores when raindrops hit it. Well, my finger's hitting it now, but when it rains, um, the spores come out. So that's what they look like when they're very old. At first this kind of looked like a mushroom, but it's actually part of an old turkey egg. So sometimes you're looking for mushrooms and you get fooled. Down here on this log, this may trick you into thinking that this is fungus. Let's take a closer look. These little pink balls that are on the surface of the log. This is actually a slime. This is made up of amoeba. This is not a fungus. The name of this slime is wolf's milk. So this is a young specimen. It's nice and pink in color, but watch when I push on it. Ooh. <laughs> Look at that. That is a slimy little bit of the organism, and it's sort of a toothpaste consistency. As these age, they get kind of a, a grayish color. Here's another fungus growing on a uh, dead cedar. This is a jelly tooth fungus, so it's really gelatinous, and we remove it from the wood, you can see it has little teeth underneath and it's extremely gelatinous. It reminds me of a cat tongue. As you can see, it's so flexible and it's got these little, it's like papillae here <laughs> on the undersurface. So this is a jelly tooth fungus. It feels really interesting. Here's a larger specimen and you can see it has a little bit more of a stalk on it. Very soft, wet, gelatinous. Getting a little bit tan on the top with age. It kind of starts out a little bit more clear, translucent, and it's got these little papillae underneath. Very unique. Well, I'm in the coniferous area now, and I'm seeing something red up ahead. I'm really excited. Let's take a look. Oh, beauty. Look at that. That is a lobster mushroom, another choice edible. Excellent. Hypomyces lactiflorum, which is a lobster mushroom, is the fungus that parasitizes either a russula mushroom or a certain kind of lactarius mushroom. And it transforms it into what you see here, this thick red mushroom. It's quite heavy, actually. Let's just take a peek and see what's going on underneath all this leaf litter here. Ooh, now some of it's gotten a bit rotten, so I don't think I'll be eating this one, unfortunately, but let's take a look. Yeah, it's rotten out. It's rotted. But uh, wow, look at that. It's been completely transformed from the original form of the mushroom. Uh, the lobster mushroom itself is this very bright red color. 
and then when we cut it it's normally white inside and very dense this one's feeling quite spongy and as you can see it's kind of rotten it's probably been out here a while um, this one is an edible mushroom but because of its state of decay I'm not going to be taking it today to eat ah so unfortunate oh well uh, this is one of my favorite mushrooms uh, it does have a bit of a, a lobster or a seafood like taste some people have a bit of a sensitivity to it due to the iodine content um, but look at the size of this mushroom it's huge um, so I'll just leave this here to continue rotting in the forest but uh, boy that would have been a beautiful find if it wasn't uh, in an advanced state of decay just what I was looking for some turkey tail so here we are Tremides versicolor this one's more muted with blues and grays but still has those beautiful white pores underneath so we know it's the Tremides species so I was looking for bluets today and I didn't find any, but here's a um, Cortinarius. First off, let's take a look. It's growing under, um, in sort of a mixed forest here with a lot of fur. We've got some um, birch over that way. I'm going to use my knife here to cut it. Take a look at it. Interesting. So it has kind of like um, a little purplish color. The stem itself is kind of like a, an orangey color down the center. Another beautiful, beautiful mushroom. Take a look at my bag so far, guys. It's getting full. This is a good day in the forest when your bag is so full. So you notice that I forage with this bag. It's a mesh bag. It's called Earthwise. Um, I think people use it for actually storing veggies in the fridge, but this is great. You can carry it around and then the spores will uh, come out of the mushrooms and spread all over the forest. And more mushrooms will come next year. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the show for today and hope you learned something. Remember when you go out mushroom foraging for the first time to make sure you identify the mushrooms positively with a couple of resources. Go out with someone who knows what they're doing. It's an addicting hobby. Lots of fun. All right. I hope you have a great week as always. Take care.